Eileen Lacey, who is the faculty director of Hastings, to introduce uh, today's speaker. Well, I haven't said hello to Hi, Walt. Hi. <laughs> Brandon from teaching, so I haven't said hello. And I confess, I sat here for a minute trying to figure out, I finally realized what this slide is of. I thought it was Walt standing in front of the new entrance to the Hastings Reservation, <laughs> making changes down there, but no, it's not. And then he may explain where he is. I know where you are now, but yeah. Anyway, it's my pleasure to welcome back Walt Koenig, who has a long association with the MBC. In fact, he's probably been here longer than many of us in this room. Um, and he just disappeared. Okay, just well, disappeared that was the end of that association. <laughs> <laughs> so, Walt arrived in Berkeley in 1972 to start his graduate degree by working under Frank Patelka, who was a renowned avian ecologist and population biologist. Walt had done his undergraduate degree across the bay at that other school before seeing the light and coming to Berkeley to do his graduate studies, and in a sense, he's never really left. Okay? Walt completed his degree in 1978, but after a brief, almost sabbatical interlude at Occidental College for a year, he came back to Berkeley and was the zoologist in residence at the Hastings Reservation for many, many years. So Walt had the great good fortune, we had the great good fortune to be able to employ him full time to live and work at Hastings and <coughs> his research down there. Walt left in 2008 um, and moved to Cornell University where he has had appointments in both neurobiology and behavior and with the world famous lab of ornithology until this past year, 2016, when he formally retired and moved back to Carmel Valley. Surprise, I, don't, I can't understand why you wanted to do that. So that's Walt's official biography. More on the research side, it's hard to capture in words, easily or succinctly, how important Walt's work at Hastings has been. It's one of the longest continuous running annual mark recapture study programs of a vertebrate in anywhere, really. As you'll learn today, one of his focal or his focal study organism is the acorn woodpecker, a very iconic coastal California species. And Walt has now been studying these birds for more than 40 years, continuously, and with, as far as I can tell, continuous federal support. And if there are any gaps there, don't say that. But it's an impressive record of continuous long-term support from NSF to engage in this research. As a result of long-term data sets, Walt's been able to dig into questions that few people can answer, and he's therefore become an international authority on avian mating systems, avian behavioral ecology, and more generally, social behavior. At the same time, Walt being Walt, he couldn't just stick to woodpeckers, and his research tentacles have spread over the years. To, he's now looking at oak phenology, <coughs> masting in California. This is obviously an important resource to the woodpeckers, but has branched out into looking at now plant ecology and plant evolutionary biology. If you go down to Hastings, you'll see oak trees that look like they have belts around them everywhere, and that's part of Walt's research measuring oak growth year to year. So in other words, although acorn woodpeckers have been the bread and butter, Walt is, is looking at all kinds of things in California, as is his research team, which has long been based at Hastings. I hope I've conveyed that not only has Walt been a big presence in our research program here at Hastings and the MBC, but really internationally as well. And to that, we're really grateful to have had him based at Hastings for all these years. I don't think there's much more I need to say, oh, other than, sorry, I need to look Monty Python-esque, two more things. <laughs> One is, I suspect, knowing Walt, he's going to be making a run to Top Dog right after the talk. <laughs> so if anyone wants to talk to him, that might be a chance to catch him. And second, I guess this is where I was going to wrap up, what more can I say other than waka waka waka? Thanks, Eileen. It is great to be back. I, uh, I, well, I, as Eileen mentioned, I, well, I came to Berkeley in 1972. Uh, I did not actually have a major professor, and I can assure you that is not the way to start your graduate career. Uh, but that's a whole other story. I did eventually get lucky and managed to fall into Frank Patoka's lab. And uh, at the time, there was a guy down at Hastings, uh, Michael McRoberts, who had started the uh, studying acorn woodpeckers down there. Uh, and was about to leave, uh, and uh, literally I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do, so 
I thought, oh, well, uh, gee, maybe I could, I mean, I still didn't actually have a major professor. So I went down to Hastings and uh, figured, well, you know, maybe I could do these things and study them. And uh, Frank was seen to be interested in them, so I could talk him into being my major professor. And uh, I got lucky in that latter respect, and I got lucky in the former, too, because Hastings just turned out to be a wonderful place. And literally, I really never wanted to leave. And as Eileen said, I've done a pretty good job of kind of meeting that goal. Um, anyway, but I do want to give a nod to Cornell and upstate New York, where, of course, Eileen did her undergraduate work. So that's why she knows that uh, Ithaca does have some things that Berkeley does not, including... Yeah, AT&T. AT <laughs> including an annual ice festival on the commons. And so here I am at the 2013 ice festival. I, Berkeley, as far as I know, has never had an ice festival. <laughs> uh, this, is, this thing was just amazing. This is actually a bar, an entire bar made out of ice. And I'll tell you, they had just fabulous frozen daiquiris. <laughs> It was really fun. <laughs> All right, well, back to California where, uh, as Eileen again mentioned, I retired this year, last year, last year, so that I could come back here full time and not feel guilty about it. Actually, I, as I keep telling everyone, it turned out all those years people paid me and I was pretty much doing what I wanted. And then I discovered, it took me all those years to realize I could continue to do what I wanted and I didn't have to get paid. It was fabulous. I don't know why it took me so long. Anyway, back to Acorn Woodpeckers, which is really what I've managed to uh, build, pretty much make my entire career on ever since starting as an undergrad, undergrad? No, graduate student, taking over from the McRoberts, who left about that time. And I moved down to Hastings and, again, really did my best never to leave. Uh, I'm not going to tell you too much about acorn woodpeckers today, which I think is unfortunate because it's probably been 10 years since I gave a museum lunch. And so most of you don't really know much about acorn woodpeckers. It's tragic. <laughs> uh, so I'll have to come back next year and I'll give you an acorn woodpecker talk. Uh, but for those of you who don't know anything about acorn woodpeckers, they're the ones who make these fabulous <coughs> granaries. They drill these holes in trees by the thousands and store acorns in them. So this is only one of the many unique aspects of the biology of acorn woodpeckers. Uh, the reason it's not even the one that's sort of kept our interest for 40 years, uh, that's the fact that they're cooperative breeders and have extremely interesting and bizarre social behavior. Uh, but it is what got me interested in acorns, which Somehow, as a zoologist, I sort of figured the botanists had their new all about. They knew about these things. In fact, at the time, there was a, there was a botanist at Hastings, Jim Griffin. Uh, MVZ used to have a research botanist on its staff, believe it or not. Uh, and he was an oak specialist. But uh, he didn't really know anything about acorns either, as it turned out. Uh, so it's one of those times in my career that after kind of, you know, mulling it over and letting it slide for quite a while, we finally realized, that, or I finally realized, that if I was going to really find out something about acorns, I was just going to have to do it myself. So that's kind of what got me interested in oaks, and uh, which are the ones, the trees that produce those acorns. I, I did learn that pretty early on. Um, so let me tell you about oaks. And uh, those of you who have been in California for a while probably know most of this, but you may not be aware of kind of the oak situation. Uh, so, in brief, oaks cover about 10% of California, 10 million hectares, acres, acres, I guess. Yeah, there you go. Uh, about 20%, 5% of the forests are made up of oaks or oak woodlands, oak forests. But here's the thing about oaks. Most of that oak woodland is not protected. Almost all of it is in private hands. Only 4% of oak woodlands are protected in the state of California. So it makes it a lot more challenging to study these things than you might think. Because most of the places you would want to go where there are these beautiful oak woodlands out there, they're all on ranches. And I'm sure there's some very nice ranchers out there, but. <laughs> To quote someone, most of them, no, I won't even continue on that. 
Uh, a lot of them do not really want you out there doing anything on their land, and it's not very easy to get there and do anything. Furthermore, even if you can get there, you can't be sure it's going to stay Oak Woodland very long because what happens to a lot of it is that pretty soon it turns out you go back next year and you know, it's turned into a subdivision. Or well, another thing that happens in California a lot is that it turns into a vineyard. And uh, for any of you, I mean, I spend a fair amount of time driving, you know, sort of east of Hastings. You get into the Salinas Valley, and then you go south on 101 towards Santa Barbara. I'll tell you, within the last 20 years, the, num the amount of land that's been turned into vineyards along that road is just incredible. And that's been happening for some time in California, of course. I'm not even sure who... Boy, there we go with AT&T. Oh, just again. turn off your, your Wi-Fi. Oh, yeah, on. there you go. Okay. I'll try to do that. Okay, anyway. All right, but the other thing I want to mention about Oak Woodlands is that there's been a very interesting problem for some time. It's not the one I really studied, but I have to mention it, which is illustrated pretty well by this picture. This is actually the Santa Rosa Plateau <laughs> in uh, Riverside County. It's really a beautiful place. Uh, but it's kind of typical of a lot of oak woodlands in, throughout California, uh, which, by the way, blue oak woodlands in California are recognized as some of the most extensive old growth forests left in North America. Uh, because a lot of those trees are three, four hundred years old. And except for, you know, there have obviously been changes, which I'll mention, but a lot of it is relatively untouched. Uh, millions of acres of it. Okay, well, these are actually Engelman oaks, they aren't blue oaks. Uh, but still, what's typical about this is the fact, and I won't make you guess, but you can sort of think about what's weird about this picture. What's weird, if you're from the east, is that there's no understory. And why is there no understory? Well, well, there's no understory. There are no baby oak trees. Okay. And so that realization, which was actually one of the things that Jim Griffin, the research botanist here in the museum, uh, was one of the first to kind of point out, uh, has led a lot of people to worry about the long-term prospects of oak woodlands in California and about what's fondly known as the regeneration problem. So I'm not going to talk at length about the regeneration problem, except I find it a really interesting one, because not only do we not know what is causing it, but we don't even really know if there is one or not. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. But some of the usual suspects, if there's a problem, is the fact that California really has changed a lot in the last 250 years. Uh, not the least of which is that it used to be covered by things like this. These are native bunch grasses. Okay. Now those bunch grasses are still around, but they were perennials. Okay. You can actually, if you look carefully, you can sort of see the base here, being the, which is still of these bunch grasses, which are still green. Okay. They don't die. What happened back when the Spanish came in the 18th century is that they brought their cattle, they dumped their Mediterranean weeds out here when they got here, and pretty soon the entire state was taken over by Mediterranean grasses, which are annuals. That's where the rolling golden hills of California come from. The Spanish, we have the Spanish to thank for that. Uh, but as a result, not only has this changed the, not the landscape so much, but it's changed the entire ecology of, of oak woodlands in California dramatically. But it also makes it a nice fire hazard because all these grasses die every year and uh, it does dry out pretty much every summer and uh, you get these fires which uh, you know can be fairly destructive. Okay, not only that, so it's not only <laughs> changed things on that level, it's also changed the fauna. So there are things which are no longer around. This perhaps is not because of the grasses so much as because of the people. Uh, but you don't, you don't see those grizzly bears foraging around in valley oak woodlands very often anymore. Uh, and then there are a few killer mammals which are just more common than they used to be. This is just for Jim. Those are those, are those gophers which are at incredibly high densities in a lot of these oak woodlands. 
um, because I think it has a lot to do with the fact that you have all these Mediterranean grasses, which are incredibly productive in the spring when you have all the water, and uh, you know then what happens? They all die off in the summer, and uh, you know if you're ever trying to start a garden somewhere out in the wild, uh, you know it's a problem because once that happens, those gophers are out there eating anything they can. All right, but on top of that is really the fact, and this is something which yeah, everybody knows it, but I don't think it's appreciated as much as it probably should be. Because it's so dry in California, hope that doesn't come as a shock, uh, despite the fact that it's been kind of wet this winter up here anyway, uh, things, regeneration such as it happens is really slow. Okay, so, and this is really striking. We do have a site in Minnesota that we did for many years where we counted acorns. Uh, and there, if you don't burn the savanna, within five or ten years, you cannot walk through the area because there's so many baby oak trees. <coughs> All right, I'll get rid of it. I think I'll get rid of it. I'm going to get rid of this thing. Stop. <coughs> there we go. Uh, ooh, I can't even find it here because of Ah, oh, there you go. Turn Wi-Fi off. Very good. Right. Okay. Uh, so what you have here, however, is the fact that regeneration does occur, but it's incredibly slow. So these are two, this is my colleague John who does a lot of this work with me. These are two blue oaks, which were marked by Keith White, who was the research botanist in the museum before <coughs> Jim Griffin, who marked these things in 1965. Okay. So these are 50 years old. And there they are. They're still hanging in there. Every year they get browsed by the beer. Beer? By the beer? Did I say beer? <laughs> browsed by the deer. Uh, but they're just waiting for their chance to actually, you know, I don't know what, when the deer maybe aren't there one year and there's a lot of water and they could actually make it. The point is, I think these things can live down here in the grass for a century. Okay? Once they make it up above the browse line, they're going to be there for four or five hundred years, okay? with any luck at all. So and in that in-between stage, which is what just doesn't seem to be there, it only lasts a couple of years. So to me it's just not that surprising that you go out there and you hardly ever see a lot of sapling oaks. It's because it's not that they never occur, but when they do occur, it's just in this very short time <coughs> compared to the other life stages of the oaks. Uh, anyway, that's my take on it. But of course, I don't even study that, so uh, I'm just making it up. You can <laughs> take it or not as you wish. What I do study are these acorns, because that's what the woodpeckers, uh, of course, eat. And so that's what got us interested in the, in the whole sort of situation. Acorns turn out to be really important for a lot of reasons as well. Uh, they were extremely important to the Native Americans, the Native Californians, before we got here. Uh, in fact, half the diet of some of the tribes, of several of the tribes of California Indians, is estimated to have been made up of acorns. Now, if any of you have ever tried to eat an acorn <laughs> from a California oak, just think about that for a minute and let it sink in. That someone tells you now you're going to have to get half your calories from those things. Good luck. It's going to take you a lot of time and effort. But it's really interesting. They made these structures. These are Miwok granaries where they stored acorns. I kind of like that because it's, of course, the <coughs> acorn woodpeckers do. They store the granaries. They grind them up in these nice little grinding rocks, which, of course, you can find all over the place in California. And then they made this meal out of it, uh, which they then baked and did various things with. Um, anyway, there's I have colleagues in Spain <coughs> who talk about how, oh, when I get hungry, I just you know pop an acorn off the tree and eat it. Well, you can do that in Spain because I think the Spanish have been selecting oaks for a thousand years to have edible acorns. But I'll tell you, you cannot do that in California. <laughs> anyway, all right, so people have been, uh, it's been important to the people for many years. It's important, of course, to the friends of the forest. 
Uh, some of these acorns are really quite sizable. You want to watch out if one of the things, one of these guys falls on you. Uh, which then gets us back to, to acorn woodpeckers. All right, so it does turn out that uh, I just want to briefly mention that those acorns are extremely important to the woodpeckers. Uh, they not only determine their reproductive success, so this is in brief the Prior Falls acorn crop just plotted against the reproductive success of the woodpecker population the next spring. Okay, each one of these points is a year. Basically, if it's a good acorn crop in the fall, the birds, they actually, if it's a really good crop, they can even have nests in the fall, but then they'll just go crazy the next spring. If it's a bad acorn crop, a lot of groups won't even try to breed. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is based on Christmas bird count data. Uh, and what it is, it's the density of acorn woodpeckers throughout the Pacific coast as a function of how many oak species, oak tree species, are within the Christmas <coughs> bird count circle, basically within that area. And what it shows is that the distributional limit of acorn woodpeckers, turns out it's not set by the distributional limit of oaks. It's set by where there are at least two species of oaks out there, which is Presumably because when you have only one species of oak, it's likely to fail every three, four, or five years, and the woodpeckers just can't make it in those areas. When you have more than one species, the probability of both of them failing at once, and you have an acorn crop failure is much lower, and the birds can do pretty well. But this is why, as I always like to say, there are no acorn woodpeckers outside here whacking to you as you walk around going to your classes. Or there are, no even, there are not even any acorn woodpeckers over there in Oakland. You got to go over because there's only one native oak species here, coast live oaks. You go over the hill and they become one of the most common species. I also want to mention work by another old MVZ grad, Rick Ostfeldt, uh, who's done fabulous work at the East. He's now at the Cary Institute. Uh, he studies mice. He's, you know, sort of, I study birds. He studies mice. But what he discovered was that the acorn crop drove pretty much the entire community back there. So if you have a good acorn crop, you have lots of mice. You have, uh, you know, you have the deer do really well. Uh, he was, in, you know, some of his colleagues have looked at the effects on ground nesting birds. Uh, but what he got really interested in is the fact that when you have lots of acorns and lots of deer and mice, you get lots of ticks, and you get lots of Lyme disease, which is, of course, a big deal back there. So it's something which uh, these kinds of things, I've kind of looked for some of these. I've found a little bit here on the west, uh, but nothing quite as dramatic as he's managed to find uh, back there. Anyway, what this has gotten us into is counting acorns, uh, what we like to uh, fondly call, modestly refer to as the California Acorn Survey. Uh, and uh, what we do, all well, this is all based on visual surveys. I did spend a lot of time putting traps out there in the early years, finally gave up for reasons I will not go into. Uh, but it's taken on a life of its own. Originally we did it because of the woodpeckers. Now I do it because, I don't know, I just can't imagine life without counting acorns. So there you go. Uh, there are lots of ways. There's all sorts of variation, interesting problems with the acorn crop. I'm not going to talk about all of them. I'll just try to get to two, uh, the first of which is uh, sort of the basic annual variation uh, of the acorn crop, basically what I'm talking about when I'm discussing masting behavior. Okay, so this gets us to the Hastings which is where all this has been centered over the years. It's a lovely spot, if I do say so myself, and is one of quite a few other UC natural reserve systems. I know there are others even closer to campus than Hastings, but forget it. None of them hold a candle to Hastings Reservation, which is a beautiful spot, and if I never leave there again, it'll be too soon. I also want to give a little call out to Vince, who's back there in the back. He's the director of Hastings, and if you're interested, he's a wonderful guy, incredibly helpful for anything you need or, you know, any problems you have. So if you need, are interested in going down, uh, by all means, talk to him. 
Okay, so to get to Hastings, you go down, you go south. Uh, here's uh, Monterey Bay, the Monterey Peninsula. Here's Carmel Bay, and uh, you go up Carmel Valley, 26 miles, and you get to uh, really some of the most beautiful oak woodland anywhere. And that's, of course, I'm cheating here. This is actually looking over on the next ranch, but forget <laughs> that. It's a beautiful area. Uh, and the species, one of the species I'm probably going to be focusing on is the valley oak. Uh, valley oaks are found <coughs> one of the, a couple of species of California oaks which basically ring the central valley. Uh, so they have quite a right, wide geographic distribution, but they are endemic to California. Uh, and they produce these nice big acorns which are kind of fun to, to play with. All right, so they do vary a lot in how in the acorn crop that they produce for year to year. So this is masting behavior. Masting is more, however, than variable acorn production. It's the fact that these trees are doing it synchronously okay, within a population. So that's what really makes it interesting. One tree producing a lot of acorns some years and not very many acorns other years, okay. But within the population, Basically, all the trees are doing that. In a good year, almost every tree is loaded with acorns. In a bad year, you have a hard time finding an acorn out there okay, on any of these trees of that species. Okay, so why? What's going on? Well, there are lots of different levels that you can look at this at, and I'm pretty interested in all of them. But the one I'm going to focus on right now is one of the prox of the proximate mechanism driving annual variation in the acorn crop. So what's sort of driving masting? Not at the <coughs> evolutionary level, so we aren't talking about predator satiation or something here. Uh, we're talking about what is it that's going on that is, that is producing this variability. And one of the really interesting questions is whether it's just some cue that the trees are, you know, sort of somehow picking out of the air, or is there some functional relationship between whatever that mechanism is and masking? And I'll explain this a little bit more here. So what we've known for a long time, and this doesn't apply to all the species, but it does apply to valley oaks, which is, again, what I'm going to focus on for the time being, <laughs> is that there are two correlates with the annual acorn production. Okay, two main correlates, one of which is what they did the year before. <coughs> Okay, so if it's a good acorn crop last year, it's probably not going to be a good acorn crop this year. And if it's a bad acorn crop last year, then, you know, you're much more likely to have, produce a lot of acorns this year. Okay, that's one. I'll come back to it in a second. The other one is mean maximum April temperature. Okay, so how warm it is in the spring correlates pretty well with the acorn crop. Again, each one of these points is a year, so we've been doing this for a while. If it's warm in the spring, they do quite well in the fall. These are a one-year species, so they're flowering in the spring, producing acorns in the fall. If it's cold and wet, and in California, <coughs> cold means it's wet, then they don't do very well. All right, so what does this tell us? Well, the fact that you have this negative autocorrelation in terms of what they're doing from one year to the next immediately suggests there's something about availability of resources. Okay, if they put a lot of their resources into making acorns this year, then, you know, I guess they don't have as much to put into, re into making acorns the next year. Okay, it's turned out to be very difficult to really test that, but there's a lot of reasons to believe that there's <coughs> some truth to that. I'm not really going to focus on that. What I want to focus on is this other one, because the fact that you have this relationship with what's going on in the spring says, at least implies that there's something about pollen availability or fertilization or something that then affects the acorn crop in the fall. Now, what's really interesting about this to me, briefly, is that there are a lot of species of trees out there and there are a lot of people who have looked at seed production and conifers and various other species over the years. Almost everybody finds some correlation with weather. Okay, sometimes it's something kind of like this, sometimes it's rainfall, something, whatever. 
So there's lots of literature on a relationship between weather and seed production and forest trees, but hardly anybody has sort of thought, well, why is that? What is the weather actually doing that is affecting the trees so that they produce lots of acorns or not so many acorns? So I got interested in that problem because it seemed to be one that was almost totally ignored. And what I really sort of fell upon as being an important issue is the phenology of the trees. So this is a picture from Hastings, two of our valley oaks, taken on March 7, 2005. And you'll notice that this tree is totally leafed out and in full bloom, as it were, whereas this tree, which is, you know, a good 50 yards away, has hardly done anything. So the point of this is just that there's a lot of variability in the phenology of these trees. By the way, they are just beginning to leaf out. Uh, Jasper Ridge, where I was last Friday, there are actually several trees that have leafed out already. They're, they're coming. Spring is on its way. Okay. <laughs> So I came up with uh, what I like to think of as one of the two novel ideas I've had in my career. Uh, and what I like to call the, the phenological synchrony hypothesis. Okay, so here's the idea. I'll go through it, hopefully, without too much trouble. Uh, first step is this, the spring conditions, whether it's cold and, cold and wet or whether it's warm. And the, the real leap here is what I'm claiming is that when it's cold, the, the landscape is heterogeneous <coughs> on a micro sort of geographic scale. And when it's warm, it's homogeneously warm. Okay. Well, there of course is no data to back that up, but it turns out there are these things now called eye buttons. There is an eye button right there. Uh, and you can put them on trees. We put them on every valley oak at Hastings that we do, that we survey, and they measure they take the temperature every four hours for practically a year. So we now have years of data for the temperature at individual trees at Hastings. And then we have a very high-tech way. This is called a palm pilot. I'm sure many of you have heard of these. I was always going to bring one so that you get to see what the future is like. Uh, I literally have not come up with a better way to kind of get these data yet. So we still use these things. Fortunately, you can get them off eBay real cheaply. <laughs> okay, anyway, so you go by once a year and you, you download the data. And you can find out, you know, you can actually measure what the temperature at that tree was uh, whatever time period you want. And it turns out that if you look at the mean maximum spring temperature overall, so this is based on the Hastings weather station, and you correlate it with the variability, the coefficient of variation, okay, among all those eye buttons on the valley oaks that we're surveying, that you get a real nice negative correlation. When it's warm, they're quite homogeneously warm. Okay, when it's cold and wet out there, you have little pockets of cold and little pockets where it's not quite so cold, and there's a lot more variability from tree to tree. All right, so we can demonstrate that. The point is that once you have that variability based on whether it's warm and dry or cold and wet, that affects the <clears throat> synchrony of the phenology of the trees. Okay, so that gets us back to these two trees. Why is one flowering and one isn't? Well, you can look again at the mean <laughs> maximum spring temperature and correlate it with bud burst date. So when these trees are actually leafing out, and it's clear that when it's warm, you know, they leaf out early. This is Julian date. When it's cold, they leaf out late. Uh, but more importantly, it affects the variability within the population. So if you look at the variability in spring temperature at the individual trees, that correlates quite well with the variability in the, in the phenology of those trees. So when it's warm and everybody's warm, Everybody flowers at about the same time. When it's cold and wet, you get these little pockets here and there, and phenology can look, flowering can literally spread out over a period of a couple of months. All right, so what does that do? We're here, we're down to here. Does that affect pollen availability? Well, that's something we're just beginning now to get data on. We do have pollen traps out there, but I'll tell you, getting those data turns out to be a 
bit of a hassle, uh, but we are working on it. We may uh, actually have this at some point. What we do know is that trees that leaf that flower, when other trees are flowering at the same time when a lot of other trees are flowering, tend to do very well. They tend to have good acorn crops the next fall. If they flower early or they flower late, then they tend to have relatively poor acorn crops. So we know that there's this kind of, you know, this implies that there's pollen limitation and that, you know, the more trees out there that are flowering at the same time, the less pollen limitation there is and the better everybody does. So it kind of fits into the story, even though it's not exactly what we're looking for. The final issue, though, is does do these conditions then correlate with the acorn crop? Uh, and again, we're back there counting acorns in the fall, and it turns out we can't actually show that. If you look at the variability in bud burst date, okay, so this is how variable phenology is in the spring. If it's highly variable, the acorn crop tends to be relatively poor. If they're all flowering synchronously, then they tend to do very well. Okay, so this is the whole idea that you know the synchrony of the population in terms of when they're flowering in the spring is what determines at some level uh, what the acorn crop is going to be in the fall. All right, so to summarize this part, the proximate basis of masting involves an interaction between environmental factors, this weather, sort of weird weather thing, and pollen limitation. Phenological synchrony is what I'm claiming is important. I'm not quite sure how well that's going to hold up in any other species, but, but I like it. It's a, it's a cool hypothesis, and it works pretty well here. And it implies a direct functional relationship between <coughs> weather and masting through weather's effect on phenology. So remember that, so I'll come back to that in a minute. But the key here is that there really is, what's going on in the spring is affecting how, the reason it affects the acorn crop is because it has a direct functional relationship on how well those flowers are getting fertilized and therefore how many acorns they pr can produce in the fall. All right, so let's go back to the sources of variation in acorn production. We're going to skip those two just because, well, you know, we do have limited time, but I have to say a little bit about geographic variation because uh, this is something I got really quite interested in, uh, which gets us into a phenomenon that I kind of got uh, roped into really paying attention to called spatial synchrony. And I can't remember if I did give a spatial synchrony museum lunch here. It was a long time ago. So what is spatial synchrony? It's one of several spatial processes in population dynamics. Correlation of temporal fluctuations between localities. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, the idea is here's space, and you're measuring something at a bunch of different points, and you do it this year, next year, the year after that, the year after that. You know, that's kind of what I built my career on. I just keep doing this stuff year <laughs> after year after year. Okay, so you get a bunch of years of data, and then what do you do? You want to plot each one of these sites, and if, it looks, if they look like this, here's one of your sites, here's another one of your sites, uh, here are years, and here's whatever it is you're looking at. If it kind of looks like this, what does that tell you? It says that having data from one of those sites really doesn't tell you anything about what's going on at any other site. Okay, that's low or absence of spatial synchrony. Okay, it turns out there are a whole slew of ecological phenomena out there that exhibit a lot of spatial synchrony, which when you plot all those values, you know, can will end up looking more like this. Okay, you know, all of them are kind of doing the same thing. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that if you have data from one of these sites, well, you kind of know what's happening at all of them because they're synchronized. Okay, makes sense. All right, uh, I don't want to spend too long on this, but spatial synchrony, I just, I got fascinated by it. <coughs> There's a lot of interesting questions regarding the patterns. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit then about what factors drive uh, spatial synchrony, so we have three options here, dispersal, okay, and in oaks that would mean the pollen is going from, you know, flying around all over the place, they're wind pollinated, so 
that pollen can go a long way. So that could be synchronizing things in one way or another. Could be environmental variation. That's something called the Moran effect, named for this guy. Now I can't remember what his first name is. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. As I say, I can remember everybody's name. It takes just takes me between five minutes and 24 hours. So. <laughs> anyway, he uh, is Australian mathematician who sort of first came up with the idea that environmental variation, often weather, could be driving the kind of spatial synchrony that I'm talking about. Another one that hasn't been looked at much is genetic similarity. I mean, that could be the reason why there is these similarities through space. And then there are lots of sort of questions which depend a lot on spatial synchrony, including metapopulation dynamics and just the generality of data from local surveys, as I just implied. Well, that got us into what I like to call the California Acorn Survey, uh, which we've now been doing for like 26 years. We've been counting acorns at Hastings for 37, but we started doing a statewide survey back in the 90s. Jean Knops, who's now at the University of Nebraska, uh, and the idea is we spend a week, go around all these sites where you can actually, you know, find oaks and hope that they're going to be there for one year or the next and count acorns on marked trees of various species at these sites. Uh, it's quite a big deal in my life. I won't hide that. We have our own magnetic car stickers. <laughs> we have our own uh, annual <coughs> newsletter, the California Acorn Report. Making acorn counting great again since 1980. <laughs> All right, so how does this work? So these are sites, some of the sites we go to. This is actually for both blue oaks and valley oaks. Uh, here's, so we're going to just focus still on valley oaks. These are the data uh, scattergram for Jasper Ridge versus Hastings. So here's Hastings versus Jasper Ridge. They're 129 kilometers apart. You'll notice they're pretty darn well correlated. 0.81. Okay, here are two sites that are further apart <clears throat> Tower House up in Shasta County and Libre Mountain down in Los Angeles County. They're still significantly correlated, but they're 745 kilometers apart. So, what do you do? You do this for every pair of sites that you have data. Okay, so here's Jasper Ridge and Hastings, here's Tower House and Libre Mountain. Uh, you plot them, you plot the correlation, the R value, versus distance. Okay? And you do that for all pairwise values, and there you go. <laughs> That's what it looks like for valley oaks. And what you see is that throughout the entire range of valley oaks, if you know what the acorn crop is at one of those sites, these are all mean values for the sites, it's, you pretty much know what it's going to be at all the other sites. It drops off with distance. That is pretty much what you expect for a lot of reasons. But even sites that are 750 kilometers apart are, are correlated with one another in terms of their acorn production. So what's driving that? I mean, think about that. For valley oaks or blue oaks in particular, you're talking about tens of millions of problem. <laughs> no, I don't want more information. I only have five minutes left. I got to go. All right. Ah, okay, let's uh, move down here. Okay, close. Uh, there we go, there's that. Okay, <laughs> throughout the Adirond you have tens of millions of trees, and they're all more or less doing the same thing in a particular year. They're all either putting a lot of effort into acorn, a lot of resources into acorn production or not. And the real question then is how can they be doing that? What is driving that? Okay, so very quickly, I'm going to actually complicate it a little more by saying that you can also do this kind of analysis from tree to tree, which we can do at Hastings. We have like 85 Bark Valley Oaks we've now counted acorns on for 36 years. And uh, so here, this is what it kind of looks like if each one of these points is a pairwise correlation for two trees, <clears throat> and there are thousands of them, so I just plotted some of them, but here's the regression between those. And then here's the plot I just showed you of the statewide data. The point is that you get a lot of spatial synchrony, in a, and it declines with distance. This is over an area of three and a half kilometers within mm -hmm. Hastings. 
This is over a distance of 750 kilometers across the state of California. And uh, so what factors are driving the spatial synchrony? You have space, which is basically <coughs> saying it's dispersal. You have weather or environmental factors, which are moran effects. These environmental factors are phenology, which is also a moran effect, given that it's being driven by weather, changes in weather, as I already talked about, and genetic similarity. Turns out there's a really neat way to do this. You can basically do regressions, but you do them on matrices. So these matrices are the pairwise correlations. Okay, and now there's an R library. You can just kind of pretend like it's a, it's a regression. And it'll tell you how important these different variables are. And it, interestingly enough, it turns out that for locally, dispersal, just as in proximity, doesn't tell you anything. What really is important is the environment, water availability, as it turns out, and phenology, which again being, is, is being driven by uh, temperature. Um, genetics isn't important at all. On a statewide scale, proximity does make a difference, but in fact, it's all being, you can show that it's being driven again by weather, because if you put those things together, weather is still significant, but proximity or elevation are not. Okay, so the point is spatial synchrony is high, both locally and regionally. I think one of the interesting things about this analysis is that the drivers may differ depending on the spatial scale you're looking at, but in Valley Oaks, it all sort of comes down to, and for me, I'm kind of a Moran Effect fan, it all comes down to environmental factors, uh, either annual rainfall or water availability or the effects on phenology and Moran effects end up being really critical. All right, so I'm going to end there. I do want to have this beautiful picture of oak woodlands. Really, if it's going to be a great spring. And if any of you do not have a lot of experience out there enjoying them, this should be a great year for it, and I encourage you to do it. They're fabulous. So, great. Thanks a lot. Jim, wait for this question. Yeah. Just yeah. yeah, no, no. It's, you know, my the, pleasure. The, the golf, recognized. The golfer expert. One of the few people your who is here longer than I've been. Bill and I. So getting back to that issue about uh, growth of the seedlings mm -hmm. and how... So what is known about the age structure of the stands of single species oaks? I mean, do you get spurts of growth or are they... You know, are those are the ages of a single uh, cluster of oaks? Uh, there, there are probably people here who know more about this than I do, but my, as far as I know, there is almost nothing known. And the re there are a couple reasons for that. One is that it's very difficult to age these oaks because some of them, like the blue oaks, grow extremely slowly. They're growing in some of these soils that have almost no water. And it's really hard to corn. You can do it. People have done it, and they know they're hundreds of years old. But you know, it's really hard to do it on a large scale. There's one study on the Tahoe Ranch where some guy did that, you know, back in the 780s or something. But and he concluded that they had all, you know, it was some clear cut they'd done. <clears throat> he concluded that they had all grown up in like the 1880s or something. But I'm, I'm, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm just sort of guessing maybe, but my hypothesis is that they got clear cut back in the 1880s and those were just all sprouts that were coming out back then, which, because blue oaks do do that. I mean, we have a good uh, site like that at Hastings where it pretty much got clear cut and you sort of have this nice homogeneous stand of blue oaks. So literally we don't know whether you get these just spurts every 20, 30, 40, 50 years when they all come out uh, and are man managed to make it above that browse line or not. Paul. I really like your um, phenological synchrony hypothesis. Um, You're sweet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, my question is, I was thinking of other ways that you could maybe test it more generally. And um, it occurs to me that um, what else will influence uh, success would be when the oaks are flowering, what time of the year, so if it's early or late in the season, and then also the, no the length of days that the oaks are, um, are have their flowers out. And so 
you might look at other species of oaks, see what's the variation of when the flowering comes out and how many days they're flowering, because the ones that have the smaller windows are going to have more asynchrony and probably stronger patterns of masking. Ah, yeah. Well, that's a good idea. It's not, uh, as a zoologist, I uh, like to point out proudly that uh, it was years before, and, and just imagine how shocked I was when someone pointed out that those oaks actually have real flowers. Who knew? Uh, but uh, seriously, the female, <coughs> female flowers are not easy to study because they're real small and you kind of got to know what you're looking for. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of effort to kind of get any data on them at all. The catkins, we actually do have a fair amount of data on. Uh, but, you know, that's where my actual thought is that, you know, we're doing all this stuff with pollen traps and stuff. You know, and my postdoc at the moment is actually coming up with some useful data from that, hopefully. But I actually think that the day when we're going to be able to do a lot with that is sort of five to ten years from now when you're going to be able to get, you know, hang something up in individual trees, get some indication of what pollen is coming into that tree, and then do quantitative PCR on that stuff. Because now you can't even tell what species of oak the pollen is that you're looking at. And, you know, once, you, once we get sort of better data on that, I think we'll get a lot, much better handle on that side of it. To actually get better data on the, on the flowers, that is a good idea, would be great. It's not, you know, it takes a lot of effort to do that. And hopefully there are people out there who are, you know, willing to do it. Other Did questions? they answer your question? Hopefully they answered your question. Okay. It's tough. They all. Yeah. Uh, just a, a comment on another case at George Reserve in Michigan where the, uh, the, the oaks uh, have failures and people have looked for periodicities, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, what it basically it turns out is if you have a freeze during the flowering period, you don't have any acorns. So it's a fairly simple sort of system that the, the, the oaks try to produce acorns every year. Yeah. But in the years where you get a late spring freeze, it kills the flowers and of course that... Yeah. Now that's one work. of the environmental factors which people have known about for a long time. We've even seen it at Hastings occasionally. You get a hard freeze at you know just the wrong time of year and you're right it kills all the new growth and there's nothing to produce an acorn the next fall. Uh, that certainly happens but it doesn't explain it all. It does explain you know yeah. occasionally there's some well, really it's rare, rare in California you yeah. get enough a hard enough freeze to probably yeah get well you, you can get that and well, you, there yeah, are other you know, things which affect it but it does happen. I get frost on my decks. So. But yeah we kind of we've thought about that a lot and, and what we put that in the category of what we call veto effects so there what seems to be driving a lot of it are factors which you know aren't as good as they could be and that's one which is kind of an extreme of that so yeah that certainly happens there was down front Jim watching for you I have a kind of a vaguely half-baked question mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned early on that one of the one of the uh, patterns that you've seen is that if they produce a lot of acorns in one year, then they tend to produce fewer acorns in the following year, suggesting that they were resource limited. And I was just wondering if it's possible to measure what the energetic cost is of producing acorns in these oaks. Well, you've been doing that sort of work. Yeah, there you can. I mean, you know, you count the you can take acorns and you can figure out what's in them and uh, how much energy is in them, and you can kind of estimate the acorn crop. And yeah, my colleague John, who's who's a real plant ecologist as opposed to me, um, he, he always points out that, yeah, you know, even in a good year, those trees are probably, you know, it's just not that much energy. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, it's not like 50% of the <laughs> tree's productivity is going into those acorns. It's like, you know, 5% or something like that. Um, it's not very high. So that's one of the reasons, and then the real problem with sort of the resource limitation sort of issue which is a big hypothesis. There's a lot of uh, models, several models, which are sort of based on it, which make a lot of sense, and people are all keen on it. But it's been very difficult to test it because they're freaking trees, and nobody knows where they're. You know, they're they're modular, and maybe they're storing all this stuff in the roots. I mean, who the heck knows 
where this stuff is going when they're producing all this. And so it's been very difficult. Some people have sort of come up with some effects. A lot of people have like looked at carbon. You know, they like find no relationship between the carbon stores and what those trees are producing. So it's really still this big open issue as to what's going on in terms of resource limitation. Uh, what we've, what I've used this negative autocorrelation from one year to the next and what others have used it as evidence that masting is really an evolved phenomenon because it means the tree is doing something. It's not just tracking what resources happen to be available from one year to the next, which is one of the alternatives. If we're doing that, then, you know, it's not really doing anything. It's just taking what's there and producing acorns with it. But that's pretty good evidence, I think. I don't know that it's ironclad, but it's pretty good evidence that the trees are literally kind of switching back and forth. They're deciding, you know, to put a lot of energy into acorn production this year and not next year. And, uh, you know, that that's something which has, it's, uh, it's been selected for. It's a real thing that we need to explain. Okay, I guess so now the hands are all going up. Um, let's take one more from Michael, and then we'll, I'm sure Walt is happy to entertain questions, but we'll let people get on if they need to, yeah. Yeah, sorry, always. I, it's tradition that I go on too long, so. But Michael's so it's kind of a, another half-baked idea and question following up on Jimmy's, but is there, is there some, anything known about the way plants make those decisions about resource allocation? within an individual between the production and maintenance of the soma. Right? It's a big thing in animals, and there are cues that determine if an animal is going to invest more in the production, the germline, versus the maintenance of the soma. It's, it's, it's all about aging. So the question is whether anything is known about that in plants that maybe, as it seems by the data you showed us, that may be carried over from one year to the other. So if they invested a lot of uh, resources in reproduction one year, they kind of, something was set to know mm -hmm. that it was done. Now let's maintain the SOMA for subsequent yeah. years, things like that. Well, I guess the best I should do for that is to say, well, I'm not a plant ecologist. And I would hesitate to claim that I, I know, I mean, surely something is known about that. But I don't know exactly what it is. I mean, my focus, as I hopefully I kind of made clear, I mean, I'm interested in those questions, but my focus has been more on the population aspect of it, which I'll point out. I mean, when I started, the whole idea of masting, I mean, you could read what the definition of it was. It was this synchronous production of seeds within a population of plants. But what I found interesting was that nobody had seemed to sort of stop and think what how big that population was. I mean, what is the population? Does it mean that, you know, and so the question that came up was when we had a really bad crop and a lot of the woodpeckers disappeared, was how far did they have to go to find acorns? Could they come up here and find them in the Bay Area? Did they have to go over the Sierras? You know, was it just a Hastings local kind of thing? And so that's, that's what I think, you know, has really been my focus <coughs> in this larger scale population issue, because I am a population biologist. I'm not a plant ecologist, but that's, that's a really good question. I mean, there's certainly, you know, various aspects of it, which I'm sure people know about, but I wouldn't be the one to tell you. All right. That's probably a good note. Let's good. thank Don't Walt. Good. Don't piss out. Thanks. Depending on how fast he needs to get to